So the past two years have been extremely difficult for teachers, and despite all <laughs> objective evidence pointing to this fact, there are some that insist that the pandemic has been a paid vacation for educators. Uh, never mind that schools across the country are seeing record quit rates and retirements, including our own local schools. Never mind that teachers are reporting working longer hours for no more pay as a result of online and hybrid learning. And never mind that long-standing issues like classroom sizes, school aides, and nurses have only gotten worse when they have never been more important. This pressure has built up and subsided, alternating back and forth as waves of the coronavirus rose and fell. And this wave has been no different in that um, that uh, it has increased pressures on teachers. But it has been different in the fact that there are more cases than ever before. Um, and despite the new variant being more mild, its transmissibility is making up for that fact um, as we move closer and closer to record high hospitalizations as well as cases, which hospitalizations and deaths are going to be the numbers that we want to look at moving forward as hopefully variants of the virus become more mild and more mild. The hospitalizations and deaths are the number to track, and they are going up towards a record high as well. And it's in this environment that the teachers have made uh, louder their calls for better safety protocol, and the workers in the Chicago Teachers Union have made the democratic decision to work from home for a short while because their needs for a safe working environment and learning environment for the students and their families communities uh, and their families and communities are not being met after they made that decision despite the school system having enough time to distribute laptops and other material that they purchased for remote learning instead of doing that and ensuring that students are able to in fact learn CPS Chicago Public Schools locked out teachers and canceled school entirely all this while claiming that they're doing it for the children Adam is a former history teacher, and he's now working at a, as a union stagehand, and he substitutes occasionally. So, Adam, can you tell us really quickly, before we bring Kenzo on, uh, what the local environment has been like for educators? Uh, you know, there's a pretty stark contrast between uh, what's happening in Chicago and what's happening down here in terms of the way the pandemic has been treated. Uh, I can tell you, you know, I was in a school yesterday, and... Uh, Less than 5% of the people on campus are wearing a mask, and that's students, employees, anybody. Other than that, it's really no different than what you would have experienced in 2019 before the pandemic. Uh, contact tracing has been, to some degree, abandoned at this point. Um, you know, it's... So there are things that Chicago Public Schools is doing that would seem like progress down here because at least, you know, hmm. some COVID tests are being distributed and there were some efforts at vaccination sites on campuses and things like that. Whereas uh, at many parts of Alabama, it, we're just pretending it's not happening. Um, and you just hope that you live through that. And that's really the reality that our, our students and educators and their parents have been faced with. And, you know, it certainly feels from my perspective, uh, that we've given up and uh what inspires me is that in chicago they haven't and they won't mm -hmm. and um so there are things that you know they're critiquing their superintendent and mayor for doing for half-assing things when our folks never even tried to half-ass it down right. here um so you know I, there's going to be some folks listening maybe some teachers listening to think oh wow you know why are they complaining about that because it doesn't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. And that was a conversation I had with a teacher yesterday that, you know, it just we we have allowed it to get to this point here in Alabama, but it doesn't have to be that way. And in Chicago, uh, they have over the years built a union strong enough and a movement strong enough to where they can exert demands. And the other piece of that is that our public schools have been left to essentially be the sh triage of our entire society. Uh, public schools are expected to fix all of our social ills, you know, poverty and crime and inequality. We sort of all dump that onto teachers and to schools like y'all go fix all these problems. Yeah. Well, you know, that's asinine on its face. But the flip side to it is, OK, if that's the situation we're in, well, then damn it, let's do the best we can 
to to do that and to do it right. And I think that's what I uh, see out of the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, I, I'm sure Kenzo and, and your brothers and sisters would love to not have the responsibility to fix every problem in Chicago. Uh, but when you're kind of left in that situation, well, you got to do what you got to do. And so um, I give a lot of credit for them not resigning themselves to unsafe conditions for their students and for their, uh, you know, their colleagues. And uh, real quick, I wanted to do a blast from the past quote here back from uh, the Class Action Activist Teachers Handbook, which came out, gosh, I don't know, almost 10 years ago. Kenzo, yeah, Kenzo's in there. Um, oh, wow. But, wow, Kenzo's old. <laughs> uh, there's a quote there that <laughs> I, I just wanted to here. set my... I don't look as old, but... <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, so something that I wanted to pull this quote real quick. The CTU has become recognized as vibrant, democratic and militant in a country where many unions are more likely to be engaged in the organizational equivalent of curling up into the fetal position. Unions have been uh, battled by decade, battered by decades of attacks from big business and both political parties. Yet they've been largely unwilling to remake themselves into a key player of a broader social movement, uh, nor to educate and empower their membership. So how the CTU became the kind of union that it is, one that could take on the right flank of the Democratic Party and the free market reformers and all of these issues that we're encountering. Uh, I think that's a very important story. So that's why you hear me on this show uh, talk about my inspiration uh that came from the Caucus of Rank and File Educators, uh, of which Kenzo is part of, and their historic strikes over the past decade. So, with all that said, uh, I will stop talking and let Kenzo take it away. Yeah, Kenzo is a uh, high school teacher, member of the Chicago Teachers Union Executive Board, and a co-founder of the Caucus of Rank and File Educators, like Adam said, which is a group of Chicago educators dedicated to building up their union and fighting for the rights of educators and students. Kenzo, uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. I appreciate it. Well, thanks so much for having me on. One thing, though, I want to push back on is that CPS isn't half-assing. They're showing their whole ass through this whole process. <laughs> They, uh, um, that's that's so believable. I kind of want to open up by just saying like right now, one in four people who are being tested for COVID in Chicago, we're in a position now where there's a testing facility almost on every block, lines down the block uh, for each of them. So a lot of people are getting tested. One in four are, are showing up to have COVID. And the Illinois Department of Health Services did a study where, <clears throat> excuse me, they show that the vast majority of transmission is happening through schools. Wow. So this is, uh, you know, the one in four number actually came from Dr. Arwadi, who was appointed by Mayor Lori, Lori Lightfoot as being the commissioner of, of health, public health in Chicago. And the other statistic came from a board appointed by our governor, J.B. Pritzker. So this isn't data that I'm coming up with out right. of nowhere. That's not y'all's numbers, that's their numbers. <laughs> Exactly. And like they hired people to pull out these numbers. And so as the people that are in these schools that are watching our children get COVID, uh, a friend of mine, her um, classroom aide died from COVID just a few months ago. And that was in the papers. That's not something that we're making up. Uh, we're not even saying let's go remote for the year. We're saying what would be practical right now is for a couple of weeks, you know, coming out of winter break, people were traveling, you know, just watch the numbers and let this thing die down, uh, the surge, and then we can go back into in-person. Right. Even though we know that even in-person, it's not 100%. It's not anywhere near what, you know, ideal, uh, but it's a compromise we made. In fact, a year ago, we were going to do, well, we, we did a, this kind of work action where we were working remotely and we voted and decided to go back in person because, you know, the public at that point, it seemed like they wanted in-person education again. And we knew that the, you know, it takes a toll on students when they don't get to be in person and, and work with teachers mm -hmm. and each other and counselors and social workers, all the, you know, all the positions we fought for in the last contract, we know students need access to these people. And that demonstrates that we don't take these decisions lightly. Right. 
And, mm -hmm. you know, this was not a decision, this work action we're taking now to work remotely. This was something that we voted upon and the vast majority of members said, let's do it. Some members were hesitant even to vote yes mm -hmm. on it, but said, you know, we need to have solidarity on this. We're looking at the numbers. Uh, this is a, a matter of practicality. This isn't a matter of attacking the mayor as she right. paints that in the mainstream media has given her a microphone to say whatever she wants with no mm -hmm. representation from the teachers union or even individual teachers, right. you know, MSNBC, CNN, they, you know, I see them as being very much in, you know, instruments of the Biden administration who mm -hmm. promised, you know, if he were reelected, he'd open up all the schools within a, his first hundred days, you know, COVID numbers be damned. And, you know, it's really, I feel like this is really funneling up from the national democratic party who don't care about our students and our teachers. You know, we are workers and they are potential workers and, you know, they, don't really see us as individuals. So we have to come together as a union and, you know, advocate for ourselves and our communities. So, you know, right now we're looking at the numbers, seeing how, you know, they're going. We want to return to our, you know, classrooms, hopefully after the King, you know, Martin Luther King Day break. And uh, the mayor wants to fight his tooth and nail, even on this, you know, very reasonable um, ask that we just go remote for a couple weeks. Yeah, I mean, this is like, so there, there's so much going on about this conversation about teachers. For one, people act like schools have been remote uh, for the entire two years. And uh, most, like, basically every school district in the country has been in person schooling for this entire school year. You know, so I don't know what people are talking about there. And like you said, these these I, I just want to I, I, I want to read off the demands that, that the Chicago Teachers Union has um, to, to meet the needs of the educators and the students. And th these are not like these aren't crazy things. Uh, one is have enforceable metrics to shift school to remote. OK, uh, like that se like ha going to remote learning while we have more positive tests, more positive cases than we have in the entirety of the pandemic, 600,000 a day, uh, mm. while hospitalizations come to their almost record number. Like, going to remote learning for a couple weeks seems totally, that's not crazy at all when we spent almost a full year at remote learning. That's totally reasonable. Also, real contract tracing. Totally reasonable. High quality masks have N95s. They've the CPS has actually, according to this, been rejecting help from the state for yes. N95 masks, and uh, and then proper testing and, and 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 temporary remote learning while this wave goes on. Like this, that's not that's not crazy stuff. That's not crazy stuff. And it's so frustrating seeing people attack teachers who like. What presumably go into this because of the prestige? Like, I mean, what? Who are these teachers that are going to teach because they think it's some cushy? Like, these people don't exist, and folks are acting like they do. Folks are acting like they do, and it's just it makes me so frustrated. And I can't imagine how y'all are feeling being the brunt of the nation's anxiety and. All, all this like pent up aggression from uh you know from the right wing on teachers that they've always hated teachers but i mean it's like i can't imagine how y'all are feeling right now well you know it's definitely taken a mental toll on me personally my well my wife has stage 4 breast cancer so at one point i was granted an exception to work remotely a year ago uh when when we went hybrid before we went fully in person and because, you know, even Omicron with its light mm -hmm. symptoms, that could be a death sentence for her. And we shouldn't, as workers, have to deal with that just to keep the engines rolling. And so that actually sent me into a really deep mental break for a while. I had to take some time off of work, um, which, you know, we're entitled to FMLA and I took that. And, you know, I'm still adjusting. Um, to life after that period, but I know 
many, many teachers uh, enrolled in similar psychiatric programs than I did. Like my group therapy sessions had, I can't, you know, give out names or anything, but more than half are CPS teachers. Mm. And they basically were dealing with decades of stress that came to a head during this pandemic when we were constantly fighting um, just to have safe working conditions. And a number of these people were also caregivers like me. And one of the things that I really want to get across because the mainstream media, even the sympathetic people don't understand is that this all does fall on, in the, the hands of Lori Lightfoot because I, the view, there was one, there were two members of the view who were sympathetic to teachers. One of whom she didn't do her research because she said, why is Lori, she asked, why is Lori Lightfoot making all these decisions when it should be the superintendent? Well, what we have in Chicago is since 1995, an appointed school board appointed by the mayor. Mm -hmm. And those people vote on who the superintendent is. In that law, it's called the Amendatory Act in 1995, they declared that we no longer need a superintendent, but we'd have a CEO, which is not just branding. It meant that someone with a superintendent license isn't required to hold that position. Janice Jackson, who was our uh, previous CEO, she was an actual educator. Uh, our current one, uh, Pedro Martinez, is not. So, yeah, I saw something saying that they couldn't even substitute because they don't have the proper certifications. That was actually, you know, that was Karen Lewis's line from when Arnie Duncan was yeah. CEO. That like he can't, he can't just substitute a class one day if he decided to. He's someone who never stepped foot in a in a real public school classroom before taking on CPS and then taking on the nation's schools for Christ's sake. So. Yeah, it um, it really does pay to look at the nuance. And, you know, if you just kind of look at things from the outside, you don't see all that, that, right. you know, one one uh, light at the end of the tunnel is, you know, CTU and our community partners fought hard in Springfield, our nation's or our, our state capital. So we will have a, a, a an elected school board phased in starting in the year 2024. But how many people are going to get infected with uh, COVID between now and, you know, the beginning of the phase in when there's going to be some real accountability for our board of education and the head of our schools? Like, right. you know, this is something that yeah. we have to act on fast. Why? One of the things that, that I was flummoxed by is that um, they bought all like 100,000 laptops or something. And they have not, uh, and and they didn't distribute it. Uh, are the are are students remote learning yet, or are classes still canceled? So classes are still canceled. That's crazy. Um, I could talk from my experience. My my kid, I'm uh, you know my kids in third grade, and their teacher uh, sent them home with packets for at least two weeks. You know, thankfully, I'm still on leave right now from work, and I'm an experienced teacher. So I'm doing homeschool right now. Uh, the teachers are sitting at home behind their laptops waiting for CPS just to open up the system so they can Google meet with students and, and teach remotely. But yeah, what right now is happening, it's a lockout. We are not allowed to, even, even myself on leave, I went on just to check to download my uh, W-2 to start on my taxes and I can't get in the system right now because all CTU members are, are locked out of uh, online systems. That's that's it. why would they not? So so I can almost I can understand on one level, like, OK, the next day, maybe they can say we were anticipating not having a vote to go to remote learning. So we didn't pass out the laptops. But why immediately the next day when they knew that teachers were going to be logging into remote learn? Like they're saying all of this is for the students. Why would they not at that point? I mean, even just for their own public image, like, wow, look at these. You know, they, they could say something like, wow, look at these like selfish teachers, but we're going to do what we can to make sure that these students can learn. So we're going to distribute this and we're going to continue fighting um uh, you know, uh, to to make sure that students get back. Like, why would I mean? I just I can't wrap my mind around not having classes right now. Mm -hmm. Like, why are yeah. they doing that? The thing with uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot is she's a very hard person to negotiate with because she acts very erratically, like a normal boss. Even Rahm Emanuel 
kind of knew that he could push us only so far before it would start biting him politically because he's you know he's a good political operator for his means at least Lori Lightfoot comes out of the corporate law world and I've talked to a number of my friends who are attorneys and they say that big law they, they have a thing called big law brain where the people basically don't have values but their only value is winning and anytime they're met with a challenge, whether it's a reasonable challenge or an unreasonable one, they will treat it exactly the same and they will try to kill it with fire. Because at the end of the day, you know, if you're working in corporate law, you have to have no morals. You have to go in and say, I'm just going to win for this evil corporation that's polluting, uh, you know, the lakes or, you know, a school board that's trying to uh, um, squash a union. So, Every one of her moves is a reaction to uh, anyone questioning her total authority. And outside of, you know, a therapist, I don't really know how to calculate her moves. Yeah, I mean, it's just I can't I, I can't figure. And she's trying to make y'all look like the bad guys while her child is in a private school yep. that is doing remote learning. Right. Yeah, and the school board still meets remotely. Yeah, why are they meeting remotely? If that, I mean, why you is gotta that love that when when the uh, uh, officials themselves won't meet in person, but by God, all the staffers better go in. That's so. That's just amazing. Like I can't. I mean, good grief! And all these people on, all these people, uh, uh, like in the mainstream media, like in MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, like. For some reason, they're all remote too. Talking about how y'all yep. need to be in cur in person teaching like thirty something kids in one room at one time, while they're not even meeting in a room with five people in it, in a room that's bigger than one of your classrooms that's supposed to have thirty people in it. Yep. I mean, and this is so instructive right now, of, of just of looking at how the media work because. This is one of those rare occasions where Fox News and MSNBC are on the same side. They might have different talking yeah. heads, but they're all agreeing that, you know, the teachers are, we're unreasonable. And they're not even just looking at like, what are we getting out of this? We're not getting anything out of this. I can tell you as someone who taught for more than a year remotely, it's more work, it's less rewarding, and it's extremely uh, harsh on your mental health, sitting yeah. behind a screen all day, when you know you really want to walk around a classroom, check on students, see how they're doing. If a kid has a rough day, you want to be able to yeah. spot that out, talk to mm -hmm. them. Maybe those organic them conversations, people. those organic conversations that you have just by being there, just you know, in the hallway or like you said, checking on folks, you know, before the bell rings. Those kind of things make such a difference. And uh, you're absolutely right. That's something that is such a uh, misnomer that's being portrayed by the media as if remote mm -hmm. learning is just some cushy gig for teachers to be able to, you know, prop their feet up and uh, play on the computer for a few minutes and call it a day. And that's just while that I'm sure is what superintendents <laughs> and people in central office are doing remotely. That is not the reality for educators uh, working remotely. And um, I think you you just hit something very important is what are we getting out of this, right? If 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 we're to believe the media narrative that uh, you know CTU is just uh, greedy or uh, over overbearing and they're just trying to bully the mayor, to what end? Yep. Yeah. You're not getting a big pay raise. You're not getting like all these lovely new benefits. You are making your schools and communities safer. Right. Wow. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you push your weight around uh, to actually try to address this pandemic that our government has thus far been incapable or unwilling to adequately address? And it's just, yeah, that's just so weird that they want to they have that narrative that we're trying to bully the mayor because we're talking about tens of thousands of people like mm -hmm. we're not going to willy nilly do something. And as it is with this lockout you know, we're going to have to negotiate it, but we're probably, you know, we're, we can't clock in, you know, Chicago teachers clock in and clock out like any other worker. We're not having the chance to do that. So we're putting our salary on the line to do this. 
why would we do this just to bully a mayor that we could right. just organize against and, you know, elect someone better in a few years? You know, we don't have to bully this person. We just want to have some fair negotiations. Right. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, Kenzo, is my understanding, and especially I think you mentioned it earlier. We talked to you last year. Um, and I know that y'all were able to fight to secure a safety agreement in terms of re returning to in-person instruction. Uh, that safety agreement expired before mm -hmm. the school year started. Is that right? That's correct. And all that we're really asking for is, you know, some of those measures to be put back into place. And one of those things is the threshold for cases. And it was around 10% at that time We've more than exceeded that at this point. And the mayor's like, well, you know, legally, I don't have to do anything because the agreement expired. Right. And, and I think that's um, we mentioned another day when we were doing kind of like a end of the year wrap up. Uh, and, and we talked about how there wasn't a ton of labor action coming from teachers throughout 2021. And, you know, my initial instinct on that is to some degree, it's because we all fought so hard in 2020 to see so much of that fizzle out, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that's part of why there's been a burnout is uh, even if we were able to get some concessions in terms of safety uh, to go into 2020, the 2020 school year, well, by the time this school year started, it mostly had been abandoned, uh, it seems mm -hmm. like, across the country. And that certainly is the case here in Alabama. Um, and one thing I... Uh, just kind of would love your feedback on is what do you say to an educator in a place like Alabama, for example, where um, not, I mean, none of the protocols or are, are actions, however inadequate or, or, you know, half measure that Chicago public schools is doing. Mm -hmm. Many of our school districts haven't even come close to pretending they were going to do that. So, you know, if you're if you're an educator in Alabama, you may be looking at the struggle that y'all are going through and a little bit confused. Um, do you have any anything you kind of want to just share to, to teachers down here and in, in why your fight in Chicago is important and mm -hmm. maybe what we can learn from that? Well, you know, we in many ways in the last 10 years have really set the standard for what people uh, are willing to fight for and what they want to expect. Like we got um, some really big, we, we fought for rent control uh, on our last contract fight in 2019. We conceded, but we got out of that additional funding for schools that have high populations of homeless students. So we raised expectations, but then, you know, when the rubber hit the road, you know, at least we got out the message that homeless students need extra help you know, students um, that are maybe on the brink of homelessness even, they need extra help. And if we can't facilitate that um, policy-wise uh, and, you know, the, the ruling class is gonna push that onto the schools, well, we're gonna have to have more money for them in the schools. So that that's a very tough, tough question though about what to do in places like Alabama. Uh, when I was working as a statewide organizer in Illinois, you know, I worked with some vastly different districts, different communities in rural areas and in exurban and suburban areas. And as far as like a, a, a balls to the wall kind of union fight, that often is almost a bridge too far for people to, you know, to, to handle. Um, but simply reaching out to parents, finding sympathetic parents, getting them the right information. Um, I think that is a seed that could be planted. And that's something we did in Chicago too. It just, we had to run a lot of very concurrent campaigns because we're just, you know, a huge district, 400,000 students, uh, 20, almost 30,000 educators. And we did start out with community groups because we are, uh, you know, a major urban place. We do have community organizations to work with. Smaller towns, it might be the church. You know, it might be going to churches. And I know that there's a lot of misinformation about COVID and there's a lot of very valid skepticism about vaccines and about the protocols, um, considering, you know, we can't, we can't trust the state most of the time. 
So I think it really is one-on-one conversations and it's not going to move mountains quickly. Um, but it is, you know, I think the seed that could go on to, uh, flower, you know, bigger organizing campaigns. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. And, um, something that resonated with me is that y'all are setting expectations. Um, and, and I, as someone who was a staffer for, uh, you know, an NEA affiliate, I, I would definitely say that what Chicago was doing was what I look towards and what, mm. you know, some of my colleagues look towards and, uh, you know, what Chicago doing about whatever issue. And that's a good a glimpse of kind of what's the cutting edge. Uh, both good and bad, because uh, as we, you and I have discussed before, Chicago has been a, a testing ground for a lot of the privatization and uh, anti-teacher tactics. So Chicago is often a glimpse into the future uh, for, you know, a more rural school community or somewhere in the South. If it's happening in Chicago, it may not be happening here yet, but it's very likely that it will, uh, whether that's something terrible that a superintendent is doing or the opportunity for educators to band together and fight back. And, um, you know, I think the reason I opened this segment with that quote is because what y'all have built did not happen overnight. Um, Mm -hmm. It has been, you know, uh, many years in the making of those community coalitions, those one-on-one conversations you just described, building into something much broader, which you know, resulted in relationships that really are not just in the schools, but in the neighborhoods. And and so for those of you who are listening more locally, um, that's, I mean, we're not even there yet. We haven't even made it to that point of, of having strong bonds that we've taken to another level. Um, so I, I really, I, I second your advice, have conversations, talk with your parents and students uh, and see where they're at. And, and I think, no, you probably can't transform your local into mm. <laughs> a militant fighting, you know, CTU clone overnight, uh, or maybe ever. Uh, but you can have some democratic dialogue and decision making on here's what our expectations are, and we're not going to go below this level. And if we do, this is what we need to do in response. I think just that basic level, um, that's not really happening here, but it needs to be. And, and I hope that uh, any educators listening can kind of learn from that and what y'all are doing. Um, because that's that's the inspirational thing, is that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, yes, you know, uh, it is what it is, what we're dealing with. But that's a product of decisions made by human beings. That's a product of a system that we're all part of and and exploited by. So, you know, I just I really appreciate um, you coming on the show and sharing a little bit of perspective um, and all that you and the rest of your sisters and brothers do in the education movement to kind of pave the way for a lot of us uh, in places that need to catch up. Yeah. Kenzo, anything else that you wanted to add before you uh, head out? Oh, yeah, a couple things. One is, um, and th- thank you for that. Um, when we first formed the Caucus of Rank and File Educators, it, the, the intent wasn't to take over union, the union bureaucracy. You know, that was something we eventually, over some time of organizing, realized that was really the only option we had. What we wanted to do was stop the Renaissance 2010 program, which was a program that Mayor Richard Daly put in place that had a goal of, you know, they they had a good veneer to it, where it was like, oh, we're going to open up 100 new um, small schools throughout the the city. What they didn't tell you is the the devil was in the details there, was these were going to be, they're chopping, they basically would take a school building, turn it into three schools, three small schools in there, which host of problems there. It's like three Mm -hmm. different schools sharing a gym. You had three sets of administrators making six figures that came out of school budgets. But most importantly was two thirds of those schools were gonna be non-union, a charter school. There'd be a regular CPS school with union teachers and then these experimental schools that some of them had unions and some of them weren't in the CTU. 
And it was, you know, it was a Trojan horse for union busting. And we just saw the impacts on our students when schools would close and they'd reopen them. A lot of times the neighborhood kids weren't allowed back into their neighborhood schools because of that. They would have to cross gang lines to go to other schools and kids were getting, you know, uh, Darian Albert got murdered um, mm -hmm. because of a lack of people in his building who understood the neighborhood uh, because of the 2010 program. So we wanted to put an end to this. And, you know, first we hooked up with a lot of community groups And then we decided to become union delegates. So we would go to the House of Delegates meetings where all of the union reps would come together and we'd talk about system-wide issues. When we saw that the union bureaucracy at the time, which was very much in the, the hand of uh, Mayor Daley, we had to take over the union. We had to not take over the union as you know us 12 people, but we had to organize. We had to have you know an invigorated membership so the union wasn't just going to be us 12 people, it was going to be 30,000 people who felt like, you know, they had a real voice in moving things forward. And so, you know, that is where it came from. And this kind of dovetails into what I wanted to say about, you know, how all communities are different. You know, I don't want to paint all rural districts as being one way either. When I was working throughout the state, I, um, you know, work with vastly different systems. One, one thing that is in common, though, is that the neoliberal school manager model is being exported everywhere. Mm, right. So you're having right. these administrators, these superintendents, these principals for years in these small rural districts used to be able to sit across the table from the union president, shake hands and say, okay, let's figure out what the schools need. They are being replaced by people from not from outside of these communities being shipped down there. And a lot of times when I would go and work in the, the smaller districts, they would be really worried. They're like, we can't do what you did in Chicago. We can't just hammer our, our superintendent the way you did. And then, you know, I'd say, well, let's take a step back. The only reason why we use the tools and the strategies and the messaging we did in Chicago was because Chicago is Chicago. We can't even mm -hmm. import that and take that over to, you know, we can't just pack that up and take that to LA or New York either. You know, mm -hmm. those are very different political systems. So I would always step back when I was talking to the workers in, in those districts and, and, you know, ask them questions, which is really the root of organizing is just figuring out, you know, what's the political landscape here? And it wasn't me going to their media because, you know, me with this thick Chicago accent going down to Carbondale, I look like a hustler. So I'm just mm -hmm. like, okay, who, who's a good spokesperson for the union? It might not be the president. It might be someone else, but the president's going to help with the messaging to make sure that what's happening at the table is being portrayed correctly in the media. And, you know, it really is, it, it takes those relationships and an ability not just to negotiate with the boss, but to negotiate with each other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we, we had somebody in, in the chat ask about uh, what the city's response has been to the specific demands from the CTU. Well, um, they, it's been a lot of flat out no's. I mean, there's been some progress at the table, but as far as, you know, their ability to um, demonstrate that through messaging, that there is actually progress being made, they're just repeating the message that, you know, we're trying to strike, that uh, this is about, you know, um, bullying the mayor. So it, the, even though there, there is progress at the table, um, they aren't responding publicly um, like we're you know, working together. They're responding publicly very much like um, you know, this is just a nasty fight. So that impacts the table though. You know, when when um, it comes down to like what we can, what we're pushing, the expectations we're trying to push. Um, so yeah, I would say it's, it's a lot of more of the same repeating from, you know, the 2019 strike to, you know, all of the smaller campaigns we had about safe reopening of schools and the mayor doesn't seem to be learning and, you know, her, um, her administrators don't really seem to understand how to work with us. Um, cause it does take some adjustment on their part as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know, uh, On the way here, I was listening to a couple of your CTU sisters interviewed by Max Alvarez on the Working People podcast. And, you know, one of the things that's discussed there is them just not even coming to the bargaining table. I mean, yeah. it's not, you know, I think you made this point earlier, but 
it's not as if the Chicago Teachers Union decided this week, okay, well, this week we're going to start asking for all this stuff and we'll, we'll stay home if that doesn't work. No, I mean, y'all have been pushing uh, since before Christmas break to address many of these issues and to get it resolved so it didn't come to this point. And so that's why I think there's this uh, discrepancy, you know, in the public narrative and the media narrative um, of even what this is. Is it a lockout or is it a, you know, a, an illegal mm -hmm. strike, I think, is mm -hmm. how the city is framing it. Uh, it's like Groundhog Day every time something <laughs> happens. Yeah. Like we're repeating again to the media, like, and, and, and to the public, um, you know, through other channels, like, this is what a lockout is. This is what a strike is. We are not on strike. We are insisting mm -hmm. that we want to work, but we want to have those working conditions being responsive to the actual state of emergency that we're in right now. Right. And a strike would be with us withholding our labor. A lockout is when the boss says, no, we're not taking your labor right now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very important distinction. And I think um, it is not, you know, radical for workers to organize in response to their context and in response to the real life conditions around them to try to address those. Um, and I, I think part of the reason why you get Groundhog Day from Lori and, and her media, you know, allies it's because of what we just said earlier, that Chicago is such a leader for the labor movement. And if if y'all are doing such good work uh, and paving the way for others to possibly follow in your footsteps, you must be disciplined. And, mm -hmm. and so I imagine that Mayor Lightfoot has some pressure on her to continually mm -hmm. uh, wield the stick and try to, you know, crush the union even if it's just simply in in the pr war mm -hmm. uh so that other locals don't get any bright ideas and to say hey maybe we should try to have safe schools too right mm -hmm. i mean that that's i think you hit the nail on the head you look at mayor Lori lightfoot is an extremely unpopular mayor she came in um elected somewhat on a fluke because she was you know, we had this very crowded field of candidates, all with tons and tons of baggage, you know, nasty political Chicago corruption baggage. And she was the only person that didn't have any of that because she's never been a leader before. She's a corporate <laughs> lawyer. And, you know, she kind of uh, checked off a lot of the, you know, identity politics um, checklist, however, never really working in those communities that, you know, she identifies as. And so she she kind of eked her way in there and she came in fairly popular just because she was not unpopular. She could have really wielded that power for good and she probably would be the most popular mayor uh, in recent history. Like in fact, everything she campaigned on, smaller class sizes, more professional, uh, more clinicians in the schools like social workers, those are all things we had to fight for at the negotiating table because she uh, she went back on all those promises. She could have had the city in the palm of her hands if she didn't try to fight the workers and you know any kind of common sense policy tooth and nail. And you know I think that she is at this point really taking it on for the neoliberal model right now. Like you said, like there's a lot of pressure on her to keep you know, this model here where, you know, a mayor is an administrator who fights the workers and um, doesn't actually respond or have any part in the communities that she serves. And she's struggling, hopefully, because um, I think there's a mandate there for a new mayor in 2023. Um, we have someone come forward um, who we can all get behind, someone you know, I'm aspirational for the next Harold Washington, who was the last progressive mayor we had, who unfortunately died in office. And then uh, the Daly administration came in and started their, you know, neoliberalization of the city. Yeah. Jacob, there's something, uh, there was a comment mentioned in the YouTube chat that I, I wanted to respond to, because I think it's a very valid concern. Um, we had someone say, using Chicago as a model for us locally to become more militant will only drive uh, increases in private school attendance. I, I mm -hmm. guess, in other words, um, you know, it may alienate folks. 
And I think there's a valid concern there, but I, I think you already kind of addressed that a little bit, Kenzo, by saying that every community is different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so I don't think any of us would expect if you're a teacher in Birmingham or Huntsville or Montgomery County, Limestone County, that you should just do whatever Chicago is doing and, and that'll work. Or that you should do what Chicago is doing or try to do what Chicago is doing right now more than yes. a decade after intense uh, uh, workplace and community organizing. Yeah, I think know. that's that's the real thing there is it's not so much that we just sort of copy and paste from whatever, you know, mm-hmm. y'all are doing as leaders, but to learn from how did you get to this point? How did you get mm-hmm. to this point where you had enough power right. to yeah, it, it's not engage about... in these fights? Not just this, pick these fights because that's what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's not about like how necessary. It, it's about how do we build power and and then locally, the the people who 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 need to make those decisions can make those decisions about how to use it. But the fact yeah. is that. Uh, teachers in 90% of the country do not have the power that Chicago teachers do, and they need the power that Chicago teachers do. And how they use that power is and should be up to them, and maybe they don't use it in, in exactly the same ways. But also, this is a pretty unique time, and like they have had... Uh, and even still, I think the community is in large part on your side. And in their other strikes, the community was uh, was overwhelmingly on the side of the Chicago teachers. And that wasn't because uh, communities are naturally on the side of teachers when they engage in fights with their public school systems. But it was because of the the organizing that they did with parents to make sure that they understood that, look, you know, my working conditions as a teacher is the learning conditions of your child. And that's why we're fighting for the things that we're fighting for. And that's why, you know, uh, the Chicago teachers pushed other things just as hard or harder as they pushed salaries like, you know, nurses and and things like that. And I think that that's something that communities in every uh, people in every community can get behind, like smaller classroom sizes and more nurses per capita and, and more things to make the learning experience of their child better. I don't think that that is something that's going to increase private school attendance. I think that that's something that's going to make uh, uh, communities and parents more sympathetic to the teachers because they see that they're fighting for their children and more antagonistic towards the people that are keeping those things from their children. Right. And, you know, we, it's called struggle for a reason. Yeah. You know, right. not just we're not just struggling when we're on strike either. You know, we. Right took over the teachers union in 2010 and you know we had 2012 was a hard strike where it was a lot of us building our ability to fight future fights so we did get some really good things out of that contract that improved schools but um you know that was definitely not the be all end all and what we were met with a year later 2013 Rahm Emanuel closed 50 schools in black and brown neighborhoods. Now we fought that tooth and nail. We did nonstop marching for three days um, throughout all these communities. We we talked to everyone we could, but the thing was is that because of that law that I was referring to earlier, where the mayor has total jurisdiction over the schools, he had total authority to do that. He might not mm-hmm. have had you know power on his side. He might not have had you know the people on his side, but he could always just make an irrational decision, you know unveil a media campaign to support it and then move on to the next thing. It's very much the DC way of doing things, which is, you know, where he really made his bones. And so at that point, you know, that was a huge setback for us, but we knew we were on the right side of history, which isn't just something you feel in your heart. It's something you have to remind people because after 2013, we saw increased violence in the schools. We saw, you know, people leaving the district, you know, leaving the city because their local school was uh, closed and they didn't want to have to, you know, work through the labyrinth of CPS to find, a, you know, an improved school for their kid. And, you know, we had to remind people that we're, we, we were fighting then to stop this from happening. This was Rahm Emanuel's decision completely, and he needs to take the blame for it. And that, and then, you know, working with uh, criminal justice, you know, abolitionist groups to, we whittled away Rahm Emanuel's uh, approval rating over time, and then he was left no choice but to not run for re-election, which he was planning on being mayor for life, basically, up until that point. 
And, you know, connecting all these struggles together was a big thing. But in the interim, you know, schools closed, people lost jobs, people died, people got sick, people had mental breakdowns. Like, it's not something that you're going to connect A to B very quickly to. A lot of it is just, you know, not just staying organized, but continue the organizing and stick to your values. And, you know, over time, you're going to win some of the fights, you're going to lose some of the fights, got to take the losses as both education and Mm -hmm. public education, like I was saying earlier, teaching people like, sure, we lost the fight in 2013 to keep those 50 schools open. But the ripples, the effects of that are still going on. And we're fighting the effects right now. And the only way we can do that is if we increase our numbers. And that doesn't mean just more people signing a union card, but more people committing to action in their union. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really important point. And not to be discouraging, but even if every school district in the state of Alabama had a local as you know vibrant and as militant as CTU, uh, led by CORE, we still would have problems. And in fact, we would, may even have some new problems because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the more we push back as workers, the more capital tends to push back on us. Uh, so, you know, it's it's not as easy as just we flip the switch and, OK, now we have a strong union. Now we're, we're not going to have to deal with these problems as much. Uh, it is an ongoing fight, uh, which I think that's why what you said about adding to our numbers, uh, because, you know, it's exhausting and, and folks will need to take a break and you need your next sister or brother to step in your place and keep, you know, uh, be able to pass that torch and keep that fight alive. Mm. Uh, so I think that's, that's very important. And, and, uh, and the other issue there that you, you mentioned in terms of connecting the dots uh, and connecting all these issues that happen outside of school for the most part, but have such a dramatic impact on what happens inside of school. Um, you know, and criminal justice is a good example. Yes, we have students who are incarcerated because of school uh, or at school, uh, but we know that it is a much broader issue. And we as educators, frankly, you know, if, if we are going to be responsible for fixing every problem in the country, which is sort of the situation we're in, like it or not, uh, then we also have a responsibility to try to lead on on that front. And that's where, you know, speaking to my educators here in Alabama, we need to be out front demanding Medicaid expansion. We need to be out front demanding uh, an end to this just extremely brutal, racist, over-incarceration problem we have. Uh, And and on and on and on. And and I think um, that's where I have seen, you know, progress in places like Chicago or L.A., uh, pointing towards the common good in how our struggles are connected. Um, that's very taboo here in Alabama. Um, curled up in the fetal position, I think, would probably be a generous way to describe, um, you know, our education community to some degree. But, you know, I, I get that, as that comment on YouTube illustrated, there is a very legitimate fear of pushback and, and alienation and maybe getting out too far ahead of your membership mm-hmm. uh, to say nothing of the broader community. But at the same time, you know, we, we have a responsibility, I think, to advocate for what is best for all of us. Um, and as educators, we know full well the ways in which poverty, inequality, criminal injustice. We know how these issues are impacting our students and our families. And so there's opportunity and responsibility there to try to make progress, uh, even if it is just one conversation at a time. Yeah. Kenzo, uh, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Oh, no worries. Thank you so much for the platform. It's good to get out the truth. (laughs) Absolutely. We love to hear from you. Support for the Valley Labor Report comes from the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers Union. Learn more by visiting www.ifpte.org.